Today with me, I have a special guest on the podcast. Dr. Michael Biamonte, a NASA recruit, is a New York State certified clinical nutritionist, a professional member of the International and American Association of Clinical Nutritionists, the American College of Nutrition, and is a member of the Scientific Advisory Board for the Clinical Nutrition Certification Board, where he even writes the questions for the test to become a nutritionist. He holds a doctorate of nutropathy and he is listed in the Directory of Distinguished Americans for his research in nutrition and physiology. Through aerospace research and his own private practice, he has uncovered and treated Candida, the gut monster that you did not know you had. As a 30-year practitioner, he is dedicated to improving the lives of his patients and helping them get back to living fully. Dr. Biamonte noticed some strange symptoms in his patients, such as leaky gut syndrome, adrenal fatigue, thyroid imbalance, diabetes, and vaginal yeast infections. Candida is a disease that often goes untreated and it wears a mask, so it goes unnoticed because it mimics other types of illnesses, and doctors will largely miss this. This led to his discovery of a candida imbalance in his most severe patients. Dr. Biamonte spent over five years at NASA and 30 years in the field itself to develop a treatment program to change the gut health arena. As the founder of Biamonte Center for Clinical Nutrition and the co-creator of BioCybernetics, which was initially designed for aerospace and now used regularly, this remarkable computer software program details studies, blood work to locate and get rid of the rot in your body caused by the candida germ. Dr. Biamonte is the author of the Candida Chronicles, which highlights the history of this condition, including the causes, symptoms, and most importantly, how we can solve the problem. Dr. Biamonte, welcome to the program. Thank you, Carol. Very nice to be here. I've been looking forward to this discussion. As I told you before we started recording, I myself had an issue with pylori and then also with candida. So it's very interesting to get your perspective on this and how you treat patients. But we, before we dive into this, I always have a curiosity. I'm always intrigued as to how an individual came to their life work. And you were at NASA for over five years. Can you tell me a little bit about this and how this came about and what was your role? When I got out of naturopathic school in 1984, um, I had focused in naturopathic school on the interpretation of blood work from a nutritional standpoint. So I studied the work of Ken Brockman and Jim Seema and different chiropractors who had, who had PhDs in physiology along with a chiropractic degree. And what they were doing essentially was they were studying the blood work from the viewpoint of using the blood work to determine nutritional issues. So as an example, you can give me the standard blood work that anybody would do. Usually it's called an SMA 26 or a 24. And it has various chemistries that doctors use routinely to check on somebody. And we can look at that blood test and we can interpret it from a nutritional viewpoint, not from pathology, which is what they're looking at. So typically, when they look at a blood test, if they see someone's alkaline phosphatase, as an example, which is an enzyme, is very high, they might start to think the person has cancer or they broke a bone or something because that enzyme is released when you have cancer or there's a bone break. Now, when we look at that, we have algorithms that we use in addition to the alkaline phosphatase, which would tell us the person's status of their adrenal glands. This is something that would never occur to the doctor. We can also use the alkaline phosphatase to understand your zinc status because alkaline phosphatase is a zinc activated enzyme. Mm -hmm. So I was looking at blood work from these perspectives. And when I got out of school, computers were new and kind of like a, a, a new miracle thing. So I wanted to have a computer that would be able to look at the blood work and it would be able to think with everything I knew. And in a matter of seconds, rather than would, would take me an hour to go through the chemistries, I was hoping the computer can just do it like maybe in a minute or something. 
and just pull out a report and tell me everything that was happening without me having to go through it manually like we normally do. So I was in a health food store telling people what I was doing, and this woman told me, you have to meet Bob Santoro. He works at Grumman, and he's, he already has a computer like this that he's putting together. So I said, this is great. She gave me his card. She happened to have his card. I called him up on the phone, and then I went to meet this gentleman, and it turned out he was the engineer, an aerospace engineer and an aerospace physiologist working at Grumman who developed the life support systems on the lunar module. And he, he was now working on the space, the space station project. And he was a naturopath, uh, had, well, had a strong background in nutrition, and he was developing this computer model for the purpose of being able to test the astronauts when they were on long space missions to determine what changes in their nutrition you'd have to, you'd have to uh, give them. Because what, when you're in space for a long time, there's the lack of gravity causes problems with your lean muscle mass and your calcium metabolism. So this is what he was doing. So uh, I ended up working with him for about five or six years in, hel in uh, developing this computer software program. And at, at one point, we had that almost functional, but the budget, we were spending a lot of money because we were having nutritionists flying in from all over the world, putting them up in hotels, and they were contributing to the model, but it was getting really expensive, so Grumman scratched us. And when they scratched us, we said, okay, well, what do we do with all this? And they said, we don't care, you can keep it. So we went and took the, took the model. We had a group of about 20 doctors who were intimately involved, five key ones. And we decided we were gonna start using this in our own private practices. And then we started advertising its use through all the, 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 our community to other nutritionists and other doctors. So we had quite a lot of people at one time using the model on their, in their practice. And something strange started to occur. We noticed that in about 30% of the people who were on these programs, the computer would give them. And basically what the computer would, would tell you and then re recommend would be supplements. It would recommend whatever vitamin, mineral, glandular, herbal, whatever the supplement was to correct what it found was wrong in your biochemistry. But 30% of the people were having strange reactions. They would take the vitamins and have really bad, they weren't tolerating the vitamins. They would get bad reactions, like they were being overloaded. So I volunteered to be the one to figure out why this was. So after studying um, maybe 30, 40, 50 cases, I concluded that look, from looking at their tests, the people had some kind of intestinal infection. And then I had them t test their stool and we found out they had candida. Now I didn't really know much about candida at that time. So I told them to go to them, just how naive I was. I told them, go to your medical doctor, tell them you have candida, yeah. have him cure you and then come back and we'll put you back on the program and it should work by then. Well, I, you can only imagine what kind of response this provoked. I had patients coming back saying, the doctor says there's no such thing as candida or everybody has candida so it doesn't make a difference. It was just all like this, you know, stop, I'm not gonna do anything about it, ignore it, you know, it doesn't exist. So then what I did is I took the patients and I said, well, you have to go see Dr. Bob Atkins or Ronald Hoffman in Manhattan. These were at the time, back in the 80s, the two major functional medical doctors who existed at that time, who happened to be friends of mine. So I said, go over there and tell them you have this. They know more about it. They'll cure you. So the patients came back and they said, well, this was much better. He said, Dr. Atkins showed me in his book about candida and Dr. Hoffman knew and they, so they put me on these drugs to kill it and I got better for a couple of months, but then it all came back and I didn't change anything. I don't know why it came back and neither did they. And they said, so they raised the dose of the medicine and it came back even harder. So I said, this is crazy. I've got to figure this out. So then I dedicated the next, um, God knows how many years, I guess the next seven or eight years uncovering why this was. Why did they go to the doctor, take drugs that are antifungal, and why did it, they stop working? And why actually did it make the candida come back worse the longer they took the drug? That was the first thing I was interested in, in determining. But my book title, The Candida Chronicles, is such because it really chronicles my journey in a sense through unraveling this mystery of what candida is and how it operates. 
So I would listen to the patients. I would get all the data from them. I wouldn't invalidate or say, no, it can't be. I wanted to hear what they would tell me. I got all the data from them, and then I hit the textbooks. I went into the textbooks on mycology, microbiome, and everything, and I reversed engineered to figure out why this was happening to them. What, what could I find in the medical text and the existing research that would explain why these people were not uh, being cured by these drugs, and why did Candida behave in such a way? And eventually, around 1989, uh, 1990, I had a, some major breakthroughs that gave me what I would call axioms or logics, which t will tell you when you go through them what the rules are in handling Candida. So the first thing I found was that Candida mutates very easily. And when Candida is exposed to any medication or herb to try to kill it, after 21 days, it starts to mutate and become drug resistant. Wow. That was the first thing that answered a hell of a lot of questions. So from that, I deduced that in order to treat people properly, you had to rotate the antifungals. So I came up with two ways of doing it, a four-day plan and a seven-day plan, where every four or every seven days, the person would switch the antifungal they were taking to a different one. This way, the candida could not become drug resistant to it. The next thing that entered in was probiotics, because everybody with candida was taking probiotics, and all the companies are advertising to take probiotics if you have candida. But yet, all these people still had candida. They were all taking probiotics, but it didn't make any difference. And I'm sure many of your listeners who have candida are listening to me right now know this. They've experienced it. They've taken probiotics. They've had little, if no benefit from doing it but they're being preached to that that's what you're supposed to do. Mm -hmm. So I came across a couple of books, one in particular on um, bifidobacteria and its, and its use in the body, uh, written by CNR Press. And the researchers there really went through in detail how probiotics worked in the gut versus mycology, which is the study of fungus and yeast. And what I found out was is that once candida establishes itself in the intestinal tract, probiotics don't do anything. Because what the, what the probiotic wants to do is reattach itself to the gut lining. But as long as the candida is there, the candida physically repels it. They have an opposite polarity, and the candida actually stops the probiotic from reattaching itself, so it cannot re-inoculate the gut. So that's when I determined that the only... But, but however, probiotics still help prevent candida. That's the key. They don't get rid of it. They help prevent it from coming back. So once you reestablish the, pro the, the, uh, the probiotic, then what you're hearing uh, in the media and in all the advertising about probiotics would be more correct. But it's not going to work until you get the candida out of there. So I then found what level of candida you had to reduce it to in the body or in the intestinal tract more accurately for the probiotics then be able to stick again. It's kind of like a game of musical chairs. You know, you're you trying try to get that probiotic to stick, but the candida is blocking it, and you've got to get the candida down low enough to where it's able to, the probiotic can re-inoculate. Then once you do that, you're safe. The candida will be, you'll be protected from the candida coming back and multiplying again. So I went through a series of discoveries like, like these two, and eventually I was able to put together my entire pro my entire candida program with one point we called it the gut flora restoration program and the program has uh, essentially four phases zero one two three and four and one of the discoveries i made which helped develop phase zero which is the very first step is that parasites in candida are very symbiotic if you develop parasites parasites will cause candida and this led to another discovery which was that anything that imbalances your intestinal biome will cause candida because the, the essential mechanism is the probiotics that are there that exist stop candida from overgrowing and anything you do that harms those probiotics will cause candida typically we want to attribute it to antibiotics but it's broader than that it could be prednisone cortisone uh, hormone medications particularly estrogens it could be chlorinated water in your swimming pool. It could be antacid, antacid pills that you take, Tums, Rolaids. Any of these things which disturb your flora will automatically cause the candida to start to overgrow because you've removed or you've disturbed the food chain, so to speak, in your intestines. 
The candida is the probiotics are there and actually feed off candida to a degree. So in that manner, they're keeping it under control. But when that fish is gone, the next bigger fish takes over, and that happens to be the candida. Wow. And we just, I went on with a series in doing this process, listening to the patients and then going into the textbooks to reverse engineer what they were telling me. I made this whole line of discoveries that then we put the program together. So in phase zero of our treatment, the very first thing we do is we do a bowel cleanse on the person, which helps to remove the surface layers of candida and parasites and other harmful bacteria that are synergistic with, with the candida. That also would um, take into consideration mycobacteria, which are producing biofilm, which is covering the candida, the parasites, and the bacteria. So we need to bust all that up and get that out. That's what we refer to as like the first layer of the candida. Next, we need to destroy the candida systemically, anywhere that it is. Because if it's in your lymph system, it can go back to your colon, you see. If it's in your candida, it moves around. It, your colon is the dumping ground for your lymph system. Your entire lymphatic system goes down from your liver and drains into your colon. It drains from your spleen and your liver into your colon. So candida can leave your colon, get into your lymph system, and then go to your spleen, go to your liver, go to these other areas. So you've got to wipe it out systemically because if you don't do that, it's going to go back to the colon and set up shop again. So this is where I developed the concept of rotating four different antifungals that would work systemically for four days. So it would be 16 days would be one through. And the person would repeat the 16-day rotation until we got up some kind of positive indication that we had accomplished this and the candida systemically was all wiped out. Next problem would be getting your friendly bacteria to come back in. So uh, luckily, I was very friendly in those days with um, um, Steve Barry, who was the ED of Great Smokies Labs, which doesn't exist anymore. Great Smokies became Genova Labs, for those of you who know the labs. Um, so Marty, Marty Smith and Steve Barry were so nice and they saw this research I was doing and they allowed me to have my patients do for free stool tests as frequently as I wanted them to do it. So we had the, per, the, the patients do the stool tests about every week and we would vary the probiotics we were giving them at the time and they kept with the, the results kept coming up with no probiotics showing in their stool. I have, they were taking very expensive products for six weeks, eight weeks, and still in the stool test did not show any replication of the probiotics. So then I started using, I theorized that what was stopping the probiotics was the candida, which is, was deep in their intestinal tract. It was repelling the probiotics. So we then started using fatty acid-based antifungals. And once we started to combine the probiotic with the fatty acid-based antifungal, the stool test started to show that the probiotics were now sticking and showing up again in the stool. So this is how I discovered where the use of probiotics would come in, but it's also how I discovered that it's only going to be fatty acid-based antifungals that have the ability to kill that deep-rooted candida. Now, examples of fatty acid-based antifungals would be monolaurin, um, SF722 by Thorne Research, which is undiselenic acid, and then caprylic acid, which is derived from coconut. Those are the three principal fatty acid-based antifungals that are able to kill that candida deep in the intestines that repels the probiotics. Next thing we came into, so that was that's phase two, and we're going to call that phase two part A. Next problem I, I found was getting the probiotics to really stick fast enough and uh, well enough to reestablish themselves. And I found that once a person had candida, the 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 methodology that the, the intestinal tract uses with short chain fatty acids to reestablish the probiotics was, was somehow uh, nullified. I did, didn't know how at the time, but then I found that it was due to prebiotics. What I found is that in order to get your, pro, your probiotics to, to stick in the gut, you have to use a series of prebiotics just like the person was an infant. You've got to reestablish it from the very beginning. So we started giving the people 
um, Acidophilus infantalis and Bifidus infantalis, which are the strains of Candida that infants have, to lay down the groundwork so that the um, normal strains of Bifidus and Acidophilus could evolve. And we also found that they needed to have um, certain prebiotics uh, to drop product names, for instance. One of the ones that we use very commonly is called paleo fiber. And the reason why we use it is because fiber is essential for probiotics to survive. Mm -hmm. Essentially what probiotics do is they feed on the fiber and what they produce as a result of them feeding on the fiber are short chain fatty acids like butyrate. Butyric acid is a major short chain fatty acid which serves as fuel and nourishment for the intestinal tract. So your intestinal tract can contract and, and go through its peristalsis. But butyrate is also a natural antifungal in your intestines. It disinfects your intestinal tract constantly. So this is where we started to put together the different lineup of what the prebiotics would be that had to accompany the probiotic. Next problem we had was with bifidus itself. We found that when people took bifidus orally, it wouldn't stick in their, it wouldn't get to their colon and reestablish because it seems that by the time the bifidus gets to your colon, you gotta figure, the bifidus has to go in your mouth into your stomach where very often the acid in your stomach could kill bifidus, but then it's gotta travel about 40 feet through your small intestine to get to your colon. And I was seeing that oral bifidus just wasn't doing it. I had definitely had established earlier that acidophilus would come back, but the acidophilus only has 10 feet to travel before it gets into your small intestine, so that's kinda of easy. Bifidus is another story. So what we had to do, which most people didn't like, is we had to start giving people bifidus as an enema or an implant, a, mm -hmm. fecal, a fecal or rectal implant. And to this day, that's the only way guaranteed I've seen to get the bifidus back into someone's intestinal tract. So we started using a product from, um, uh, it was Soroyal, uh, the company Soroyal. It's called HMF Bifido, which is a very powerful bifido product, a powder that you can put in an enema or some kind of a thing where you're going to do it as an implant, just directly in, ingest it right into your colon. Wow. Wow. This is just so, so there's fascinating. Some, the, <laughs> yeah, that, takes you through, that takes you through getting rid of candida and reestablishing your flora. Next thing I found is one of the reasons why, because some of the patients who would come to me, they were on like a hundred different supplements from their doctor. They were taking things that would kill candida. They were taking flora. They were taking all these other vitamins and, I, and, and they weren't getting better. So I said, well, something is not right here in the mix. I had them stop all the vitamins, stop all the flora, only take the antifungals. And then I started researching the effects of different vitamins and antioxidants on antifungals. And to make a long story short, what I found was there's, there's a group of, or category of vitamins that worsen candida. And this is not, you don't have to go too far to find this information. You could just Google it on the internet. Coenzyme Q10, very popular supplement, will worsen candida, it aggravates it. Vitamin D will aggravate candida. Calcium will aggravate candida. Copper, as a mineral supplement, also will aggravate candida. And then I discovered that any, virtually any antioxidant that you take while you're taking antifungals will stop the antifungal from working. Now, how does that work? Because that sounds crazy, but if you look at it, it's very, it's very simple to understand. Most antifungals work to kill candida or any other organism by creating oxidative stress against the membrane of the candida. So if you take antioxidants at the same time, you're literally giving an antidote because the antioxidant is gonna neutralize the oxidative stress that that medicine is trying to create against the membrane of candida. So it nullifies it, it stops it from working. And this theory that I had was backed up by some uh, parasitologist in New York City at the time. Um, there was a parasitologist who came into New York City from Brazil. And at the time when he was treating people with his own um, herbal medicines that he brought from Brazil, he had a strict rule that while you were taking his medicines, you could take no antioxidants. And that's when I understood the, the ramifications of this, that the antioxidants were literally nullifying that uh, antiparasitic or antifungal effect. So we had people stop any antioxidants. 
Next thing is I started researching how medical drugs work to kill candida, and I was shocked. Very common drug, Nystatin, mm -hmm. that people use to kill candida. It, its mechanism of action is to stop candida's ability to absorb iron. Wow. Okay, so if you have a drug that's going to kill candida by stopping it from getting iron, does it make any sense to take iron while you, while you have candida? No. Another drug, ketoconazole, known as Nizarol, it works to kill candida by blocking candida's ability to absorb vitamin D. So that immediately told me that vitamin D was important to the structure and the health of the candida. So taking vitamin D while you have candida with this wouldn't make any sense either. So we had people drop all these selective nutrients and all of a sudden the medicines they were taking started to work. Wow. I had no idea about any of this, the vitamin D, iron. I, I mean, I think about how often we are told to take vitamin D. Mm -hmm. And if and that's, we're on that's, this, that's yeah. great, but not if you're trying to kill candida. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. No, this is such good information. Now, how does someone know that they have candida? I mean, do they have certain signs, certain symptoms? And then the second half of my question is, does it cause other chronic diseases? Yes, to both, but here's to answer your first question in detail. What I recommend people do, whenever I'm on a podcast or being interviewed, if they're looking at this, do I, I'm listening to this doctor, he's talking about this, could I possibly have this? You wanna look at key symptoms of candida. Typically, candida develops after the person has taken antibiotics or taken some kind of drug which disturbs your flora, or they were in an accident, they had surgery, it was something that was a shock to the body. After that point, they start developing fatigue. It's one of the first symptoms. You start being more fatigued and you start noticing cognitive deficit. You're, you don't remember people's names. You walk into a room and say, why did I come in here? Those are the type of things that start happening with the candida patient. Next, their digestion starts to show the problem. They'll get gassy, they get bloating where they weren't before, they get constipated where they weren't before. Um, they start perhaps reacting to foods in strange ways. They eat something and it makes these digestive symptoms or even their cognitive symptoms or their fatigue worse. It's very typical as the candida is evolving, the person has an intolerance to alcohol. If they drink alcohol, they have a four day hangover. Um, sugar will create symptoms where they literally feel like they're hungover. This is simply because these people have now established a, a brewery inside their body. Yeast ferments. When yeast gets sugar, it ferments alcohol. This is how, how you make beer and how you make all kinds of alcoholic brev beverages. Well, there's no difference inside your gut. As a matter of fact, that we, uh, Dr. Truss in his book on candida wrote about a Japanese strain of candida that was so powerful that it literally had this man legally drunk. Every time he ate oh carbohydrates or sugar, his alcohol levels in his blood would go really high. So this is a... This is one of the things that starts happening. Um, eventually, as the candida evolves more, the person could develop asthma and eczema from it, or many children with candida are born with asthma and eczema. But eventually, the pinnacle of having candida is when the person becomes what we used to call a universal reactor. Now it's, it's talked about in terms of mast cell activation, which is virtually the same thing. But what happens to the person is they become intolerant of chemicals, of perfumes, of odors, of cigarette smoke, of anything chemical. If they try to walk down the aisle in the supermarket where the cleaning solutions are, they get headaches. They can't go out to parties or something because if there's per perfume or cigarette smoke, it wipes them out. They start to develop a lot of food allergies, a lot of airborne allergies. They literally become highly allergic and highly chemically sensitive. By this time, the person's developed leaky gut. Now, what leaky gut is, it's a condition where the candida damages the lining of your intestinal tract and makes it too porous. Candida grows roots. It's a plant. It's a vegetable. So it literally grows roots as a fungus or a mold, however you want to look at it. If you want to look at, if you study molds, you'll see molds grow roots, funguses grow roots. These root systems are looking for, for food. They're looking for sugar. So candida, when it reaches a certain point in your intestines, will grow a root system that literally breaks into your small blood vessels there, the capillaries, to pull glucose out so that it, it eats. 
Well, when it does that, it, it interferes with the villi in your intestines. It causes cracks to occur in the spaces between the villi, which is called leaky gut. And leaky gut would then cause anything in your intestinal tract to go through that barrier that's supposed to be there and enter your bloodstream. Now your immune system sees these weird things coming into the blood. It attacks them as foreign invaders. This is the beginning of autoimmune. Mm -hmm. So a person who suspects they have leaky gut would want to do a blood test that's called an ANA, which is a, the first blood test you normally do, a parameter you look at to see if you have leaky gut or an autoimmune condition. A set of, total sediment rate, ANA, are good tests to see if you have leaky gut. But ultimately, the best test um, is a, called a zonulin test. That's a newer test for leaky gut. You, zonulin levels can be looked at in your blood or in your stool. And there's also a breath test that I use it, pretty much exclusively nowadays. So we can tell if you have leaky gut based on gases in your breath. The original test for leaky gut was called the lactulose mannitol recovery test done by Great Smokies Labs, which is still valid, but it creates too many false negatives, I found. That's why I don't use that test anymore. But having leaky gut is kind of like the pinnacle of uh, having candida. However, candida is also known to create rheumatoid arthritis. And when you really start studying candida, you find that candida behaves very much like cancer. Cancer cells and candida both feed on, on sugars and sweets, and they both literally destroy your tissues. When you have candida in your system, candida moves like a tumor. It goes in, it grows right into your, your tissues and starts destroying those tissues just like cancer does. There's not that much difference, except the candida is much slower and less vicious than uh, a lot of tumors would be. So because of that, persons can start noticing they get muscle wasting when they have candida for a long period of time. Their lean muscle mass drops. And because candida causes an increase in cortisol in your body, your body composition changes where you get more fat and less muscle. Mm -hmm. Wow. So, so this leads you up, that's leading you up to a pretty good point. And in, uh, in a lot of the, main, the major discoveries that I made that are the key ones that need to be considered when you're trying to address candida or get rid of it. Wow, it, it's really interesting to me. I myself am diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis. I got the diagnosis, oh, almost 10 years ago. And I can look back and some of the things that you describe, being on antibiotics, having had surgery, uh, having asthma, and I believe you said eczema mm -hmm. when, when you're born, all of that with me. So this is just fascinating. Definitely get a leaky gut test. Have your doctor check your ANA, your total sediment, and get a leaky gut test, and you'll see. Now, another, I have a website that's called the New York City Thyroid Doctor. And the reason why <clears throat> this website exists is because probably the biggest correlation between candida and other illnesses would be with thyroid and adrenal. When we get into phase three of our program, the first thing we do, this is after we got your flora back, you don't have candida, you don't have leaky gut, that's all handled. First thing we do on our phase three is we look to see if the person has any chemical or metal toxicity because chemical and metal toxicity can cause candida and cause it to come back. So we look for mercury, we look for ele elevations in copper and iron and all these different nutrients which, or, or metals which could possibly cause candida. The key ones are mercury, aluminum, arsenic, copper, and iron. They're elements which are responsible for candida overgrowth if you get toxic in them. So we look for those, and then if we, uh, if we, if and when we clear the person of all these toxicities, the next thing we want to do is rebalance their hormones and all their nutrients, because nutrient deficiencies can cause candida. Deficiencies of molybdenum, of selenium, of magnesium are directly responsible for candida growth. So again, this is like reverse engineering again. Rather than saying, well, you have a magnesium deficiency, that's why you have candida. I'm not going to give you magnesium at that time because I know the candida is going to prevent you from absorbing it. We've got to go back and remove the candida and then work our way back in reverse, you see. Wow, it's so complex. Now, do you see it more in women than men? No, not at all. It's equal, probably equal. Equal? Okay. Well, yeah, because what? Well, the only um, the, the only advantage a woman might have in having candida, and I, I say this um, facetiously when I use the word advantage, is that because women are estrogen based, 
estrogen would f- stimulate the growth of candida and can uh, stimulate the replication of candida just like cortisol can the stress hormone cortisol and estrogen both can do it differently but they can do it so because men aren't estrogen based or estrogen dominant in most cases that would be an advantage a man has but in practice I can say I've seen it probably equal just as many men come to us with candida as women because antibiotics are out there for everybody you see and antibiotics right. still are the principal cause of candida that the, the principal most direct way you can get candida is to abuse antibiotics yeah, I know women are more vulnerable to getting autoimmune disease so perhaps something happens in that process uh, where it's the estrogen the, the, the estrogen, estrogen. Yeah. Interesting. especially if they're estrogen dominant a woman who's estrogen dominant is going to develop a lot of um, autoimmune and thyroid very commonly they develop Hashimoto's and other kind of thyroid problems I'm seeing this a lot with the clients I work with candida has a particular affinity for the thyroid gland and um, also it wears your adrenals out so once we clear the person of candida and all the toxicity the first issues that we usually have to take up are thyroid and adrenal and it's very typical you find candida patients with a body temperature below 97.8 it's very common they've been told by their doctor there's nothing wrong with their thyroid because their thyroid hormones are all normal what the doctor doesn't know is the second half of studying thyroid is in studying thyroid receptors and how well the body utilizes thyroid now all doctors know to look in your blood for T4 and T3 and T7 and reverse T3 and all these different blood chemistries that relate to thyroid they even know about TPOs which are the thyroid antibodies that show you have uh, an autoimmune condition regarding your thyroid what they don't know and it's shocking to me that um, I've, I've met up with um, thyroid specialists who had offices on Park Avenue and they had no clue about how thyroid receptors work or, or, or anything about the interrelationship between other hormones and thyroid as an example DHEA and testosterone tend to and progesterone tend to be synergistic with thyroid hormone in some way they help the thyroid hormone metabolize and work while cortisol and estrogen block that effect in your actual cells thyroid hormones target receptors which are in your kidneys and your liver and in other areas and those receptors are governed by trace minerals in the um, in the book written by Guyton the famous physiologist Guyton's physiology book Guyton wrote that in some way we don't really know yet calcium acts as an antagonist to thyroid hormone working in your receptor sites while potassium is synergistic with it potassium actually sensitizes the thyroid receptor sites so we started then using hair analysis to look at this because the hair is the best and the easiest substance you could test that's that's a tissue that would show you tissue storage of these elements and we started finding that um, in a lot of the thyroid patients people who had low body temperatures their calcium level in their hair was much much higher it was abnormally high relative to potassium and their calcium relates to copper you see because the mineral copper affixes calcium to your bone it's part of the bone matrix protein that the body makes to get calcium there so there's a relationship between copper and calcium and then zinc and potassium copper is also an antagonist to the thyroid hormone while zinc again sensitizes zinc and potassium sensitize your thyroid receptors to invite the thyroid hormone in like a doorman who's inviting it in and is going to help it to work to get to the right floor in the building where calcium and copper are blocking that they're antagonizing that now that's set up that way because that's a natural way to govern the use of your thyroid hormone so it's not too much and not too little but what happens in the uh, candida patient is the copper and the calcium start to rise the zinc and the potassium start to drop so even though their body's making thyroid hormone it's ineffectual it's not working in your cells because of that imbalance between those mineral receptors so therefore what we do is we take the candida patient we have them do a hair test and there's plenty of labs now that do hair testing they've been around for 40 50 years 
and have accumulated a tremendous amount of data, not only in the forensic world, but also in medical with, with physiology. So we balance those, those receptors and all of a sudden their body temperature comes up and all of a sudden the, their thyroid symptoms go away. Now, what if they're on thyroid medicine at the time? Would that be something you would pull back temporarily? No, no. I would wait to see what their temperatures do. But you're, you're on, you have got the right idea. That's a possibility. But not, not initially. You want to watch their temperatures. Okay, got As it. As their temperatures come up, that tells you whether or not you want them to go off or stay on. There, there, is, um, there are numerous products. One I'll show you right here. This is made by one of my favorite companies, which is called Priority One, and this is called Thyroid Support. This product has virtually every nutrient, every herb, every substance that's ever been found to be synergistic with thyroid hormones and help them to work. So sometimes just giving them this product alone is enough. You don't have to give them thyroid hormone because if they're producing, if their thyroid gland is producing hormone and the problem is they're just symptomatic of low thyroid or their temperature is low, Rebalancing those receptors and giving them something like this one will get their temperatures back up and they'll feel fine. So they may not even need to take any, any thyroid medication, whether it's armor, thyroid, or synthroid, or, or whatever. That's such valuable information because I know I have listeners that struggle with thyroid issues, Hashimoto's being one of them. So that's really useful information. Now, something occurred to me as you were talking about the estrogen and two different questions. So first of all, the effect of menopause. So if some, if a woman did not go on hormone replacement, uh, does menopause make her more vulnerable to getting candida? And then the second half is if she's on HRT, hormone replacement therapy, would you pull that back if you were treating her? You'd have to test their levels. And this is where testing comes in. Um, uh, from all different viewpoints. It's extremely important that you test. Uh, the hormone test I use of choice is called the Dutch test. Yes. Um, the, the, you have to test the person. You can, you can have these theories and assumptions, but unless you test them, you really don't know for sure what's going on. So it's, testing is always important. That's the hallmark of my program is testing people. We have a urine test also that the person does at home that I developed, which measures three different aspects of their gut flora. And we use that urine test monthly when we're adjusting their program. That's how we know to move them from one phase to the next or when they're finished. It's based on that urine test, which is showing me candida activity and how toxic or not their intestinal flora is. Leaky gut, another example. I can't tell you how many people came into my office, sat down and looked at me with a, with a grin and said, I have the worst case of leaky gut you're ever going to see. I've been treating it for 10 years. I've used every product, and it's no better at all. And I asked them, have you ever tested for leaky gut? Well, I don't have to test for leaky gut. I know I have it. I have up, 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 up. Well, I say, humor me. Humor me. Let's do the tests and see what happens. We test them, and we find out they don't have it. So here is the error in not testing person's been treating themselves for something they don't have for 10 years and they're wondering why their health, their health isn't moving forward. It's because they're assuming based on symptoms what the situation is rather than doing an actual test. With a lot of these people who think they have leaky gut when they don't, their problem is very severe candida and their problem are, is liver related, liver and thyroid, because they're not detoxing. They're, they're confusing the symptoms of leaky gut with just simply not being it, your, their phase one and phase two is crashed, mm -hmm. and they're thinking it's leaky gut. Yes. So. Wow. You know, you really hit it, hit a good point here, because I think people are they're just taking supplements and they're they're guessing, they're not testing, and then there's so much confusion. You know, you've got all these supplements, all of the different companies saying, you know, take this, this will help with this, take this, this will help with that, and it may be in reality making things worse. It's possible, but yet all of these companies will have references and studies that show the effectiveness of their product, but that's only under certain circumstances. What I've managed to unravel um, through the Candida Chronicles is the correct order and sequence and how you do, how and when 
you use all these different supplements where they're going to work correctly and not backfire. Yeah, I've got your book on order, and I'm, I'm looking forward to going through that because it's, it's really valuable information. And for the listeners especially, I know a lot of women that are out there struggling, they're having symptoms, and so it would be so, so good if they could reach out perhaps to you, work with you. Um, how, how can the listener get a hold of you? Well, they can find, they can find me through the three websites. Um, there's health-truth.com, which is our original main website. There's the New York City Candida Doctor and the New York City Thyroid Doctor websites. For, and for someone with Hashimoto's, I also want to mention that one of my former patients became a nutritionist and now specializes in Hashimoto's. Her name is Ina Topler, and you can find her in New Jersey. That's all she does is Hashimoto's. One other thing, though, to take a look at is what conditions can branch out from having candida. Mm -hmm. I mentioned before rheumatoid arthritis, and I mentioned thyroid. It goes way beyond that because candida can be at the cause of allergies, asthma, eczema. If you go online and you do a search for candida and eczema, you'll come up with hundreds of thousands of documents. Psoriasis is another issue that you can have. The list of other medical conditions that come along as a result of candida can be startling when you actually look at it. Many uh, digestive illnesses, IBS, easily can be caused by candida. Candida patients are notorious, glu notoriously gluten intolerant. So you, therefore you can have Crohn's disease and many other illnesses where the gluten's affecting you could be stemming from candida. Migraine headaches can come from candida. PMS, extreme PMS leading to other problems can come, reproductive problems can come from candida. Infertility is very common from, can, from candida. Um, at one point we were focusing on, on infertility in my practice and really all we did was get these women and get rid of their candida and then normalize their copper levels and they got pregnant. So you've heard of a copper IUD. Now you can imagine oh, yeah. a woman who's copper toxic has a built-in copper IUD all through her lymph system oh, with all that wow. excess copper. Never so, occurred to me. Yeah. So wow. a woman who can't conceive very often is related to this condition, more often than not, actually, from my experience. Does seizures. Seizures as another, well. Another issue. There are, there are certain bacteria and uh, parasites which are commonly found with candida that will cause seizures. We had, um, at one point, we had this one child came to us with seizures, and now I, I didn't know this. This is before I knew this. I found the child had candida. Now, my, uh, my um, thinking of seizures at that time was typically it would be from a toxic metal. So this is before autism really was understood, and we understood that autistic kids were mercury toxic or copper toxic. Before we knew about that, I knew various toxic metals would cause seizures in children. And I also looked at it from a viewpoint of um, minerals and nutrients like magnesium and taurine and these things being out of balance. So this child comes and um, before we start working on these nutritional areas, we first checked their gut and we found they had candida, they had parasites. So we put them on a program to eliminate that and the, the mother calls back after about three weeks and says, child hasn't had a seizure since the child has been on this program to handle candida and these parasites. So I called Steve Barry and Marty Lee at, at, at Great Smokies and I asked them about this and they sent me some references on diff, different bacteria. Also Leo Gallen, a medical doctor in New York who's a functional medical doctor, was very helpful at that time. They sent me references on bacteria and parasites that were known to cause seizures. So I ex explained this to the mother and said, this is why we inadvertently got rid of his seizures by cleaning his gut. Well, this woman and her child had been seeing this neurologist out on the island. And when they were going there for their visits, they would sit in the waiting room and talk to the other patients. So she started telling them, you know, I'm here, but I don't know you're gonna see me again because we saw this this naturopathic doctor, nutritionist in New York City, and since he's treating my child, he hasn't had a seizure. Well, we, pro we probably emptied out that doctor's office because before you know it, they were all these people were coming from that practice 
to be treated, and the majority of their the majority of them had their seizures clear up. You know, I was thinking how they used to treat seizures with like a low, very low keto kind of carbohydrate diet. Mm-hmm. Is is that part of your protocol? No, um, we don't. We don't have to put someone in ketosis for that to work. But if someone did go in ketosis initially, they would go through a stage of being on a very low carbohydrate diet which would reduce the candida because candida feeds on sugars and starches. So in doing the keto diet, they would be reducing their candida and any in involvement by the candida in these, uh, in these problems would naturally reduce. The, what's, what you're doing when you use the, the ketone diet for um, the seizures is you're giving the person a different fuel source in their cells because that's one of the things that's found in seizures. There's, there's an erratic operation going on in your nervous system and also in your mitochondria in terms of keeping the cells fueled. So you're using ketone bodies now instead, instead of sugar to, to fuel the person. And it's been found in a lot of cases the ketone bodies are a better source of fuel so the seizures improve. And do you recommend a low-carbohydrate diet for somebody who is dealing with you have candida? To. You have to, because if you don't, if, if the person, the diet is never going to cure anyone, because even if the person did a total fast, the candida would still be tapping your blood vessels for glucose. And as long as you're alive, your body is going to break, break down your muscle tissue and convert the uh, amino acids there, the glycine to glucose, and then it's going to be fed. But if you are not taking a low carbohydrate diet when you're trying to kill the candida, you're ending up feeding it. So you're promoting its well-being and health. If you were in a war, one of the first things you'd think of doing is you want to cut the enemy's supply lines. So you wouldn't be sending the enemy gifts of cakes and, and food. Mm-hmm. So you certainly would want to have that same approach when you're in war with Candida. You want to try to starve it so that it, starving it makes it more amenable to the medicines killing it. I I am really fascinated with this subject and you've given so much great information. I mean, I'm going to be listening back and taking notes. I was thinking I should have had a notepad for this for this podcast and I appreciate you so much being on. I I want to be respectful of your time, Dr. Biamonte. Was there anything we didn't cover today that you think would be valuable for the listeners to know? Um uh, not sure about that, but I would say that in the book, the Candida Chronicles basically has all the data in there. Um, virtually everything you need to know is in there. Plus, there's a back section where there's a series of uh, recipes that we have for low carb meals that won't aggravate your Candida. So, I would say the book is probably a good resource. Off the top of my head, I can't think of anything else. We've hit on so many topics here yeah. today regarding Candida, but there is some. Um, the one thing that I could say that would could be further explored is the relationship between hormones and candida, toxic metals and candida, and some of the other ailments, because there's many people out there who have God knows what, and it's coming from candida, and candida is very, um, very ignored by the medical profession, and I, because th- most, most doctors think woman's yeast infection, okay? But if you go into the Merck Manual, which is a book most doctors have, the Merck Manual talks about candida not being curable in a woman who has chronic yeast infections unless you also treat the yeast inside, in the intestines. Yeah, I wonder what the resistance is. Of well, the I can tell you exactly why. I can tell you two reasons why. Very simple. Now, if you prescribed antibiotics for a living, which is what most uh, practically a lot of doctors do, You're prescribing antibiotics for a living, and then you're told that the side effect of these antibiotics in people is this candida, which many people have gotten so bad that they've lost their job, they can't can't go to school. I don't know how how that's gonna float with some people. If you can imagine a person who wants to sue their doctor because he gave them antibiotics and didn't give them the advice of maybe eat yogurt at the same time or take an antifungal. This guy lost his job. You know, he's maybe now diagnosed as a schizophrenic or some type of bipolar or whatever you want to call it, which is a whole other topic to get into. 
but there are a lot of mental psychiatric disorders which are actually just candida and hormone imbalances or neurotransmitter imbalances. You imagine the lawsuits you could get? Mm, I had never considered that. But it makes a lot of sense, yeah. Yeah. Now, from a practical standpoint, for a medical doctor to, to do something with candida patients is very impractical. If you consider the average medical doctor spends about five minutes with the patient, he has his physician's assistant take the intake, do some tests. He comes in, looks at the folder. He says, blah, 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 and he leaves. You can't do that with a candida patient. A candida patient for 10, 15 years has been in mystery as to what's wrong with them. They're, they're in their head spinning trying to figure it all out. And now you're going to present them with this program to eliminate candida and, and the diet alone. If a medical doctor was to handle candida patients, he would need a specialist in his office to do that just from the aspect of the diet alone. Yeah, it's very complex and there's a lot of steps and phases to this. Yeah. Absolutely. If he if he was to do it correctly, if he was to do a total half ass job, he still needs somebody in his office where that's all they do is handle the candida patients and advise them as to diet. Because with with candida, it's not just as simple really as being on a low sugar, low carb diet. There are certain foods like fermented foods which the person could eat which could aggravate it or foods that are typically high in mold which could also aggravate it. So you need to have somebody there who's gonna present and explain all this. And a medical doctor is not going to do it. He's not going to take the time. So he has to hire someone now to do that. So there's, yeah, an, there's another salary. Yeah. Right, yeah. right. Yeah, they're, they're, they've got so much on their plate, too, with dealing with the insurance, all the paperwork. There just isn't the time. Right. So it's, it's so important, the work you're doing. And I, I want to thank you for that and, you know, the hope that I know you give to people. That's the best part of doing this is you take somebody who's been li literally in a spin for years. Um, a lot of them are very intelligent. A lot of my patients know more about candida than any medical doctor out there. They just haven't had all the tricks of the trade to handle it. But it's a wonderful thing when you actually empower these people to be able to handle it and their lives straighten out and then they become productive again. It's one of the best things in the world you could ever see. Mm -hmm. I love that, love it. Well, we are going to put everything into the show notes, including how to get your book, uh, Amazon, yeah. right? Is that the main place that you're just, on Amazon? Like, mm -hmm. like everything else. Yeah. <laughs> I know it's easy, right? Yeah. And also the websites. And I just want to thank you so much, Dr. Biamonte. I would love to have you back to discuss the the mental health aspect and that connection. That, that I, would really yeah, I, I would love to do that because it's going to, it will remove a lot of false data. That yes. People have. Yes. So we will definitely put that in the works and get that planned. Thank you Good. so much again. You're appreciate welcome. you being on. And to our listeners, we appreciate you joining us wherever you are in the world. We wish you every blessing.